namaste and yes, uh, scintillating saturday morning uh, to all the participated uh, ladies and gentlemen first of all i should take uh, this opportunity to offer superman hospitable welcome to all the participants to the first session of the fourth year international uh, virtual conference organized by subir pashim province today we have among us uh, professor uh, jian patil uh, as plenary speaker uh, for the session 1 talking about uh, professor uh, jian patil uh, he hails from pune city in the state of maharashtra of india professor uh, patil is the president of elti english language teachers association of india pune chapter he has been teaching english language and literature at several schools colleges institutes centers university in india abroad for more than four decades he is a retired uh, professor of english and uh, head of department of training and development english and foreign languages university at the uh, university of hyderabad since then he has been freelancing in indian abroad he did his ma mphil and phd from the same university pune university he did a post graduate certificate in the teaching of english from central institute of english and foreign languages uh, he was awarded uh, uh, with a british council scholarship in 1990 and did a diploma and ma in tishol from university of edinburgh in united kingdom his areas of interest are english language teaching pragmatics statistics teaching language through literature teaching list to multilingual and multicultural groups teaching list to speakers of the languages using support materials to teach english improbability skills motivation classroom management teacher development materials uh, and new varieties of english professor patil has uh, to his credit uh, to 20 uh, textbooks eight uh, resource books 80 articles uh, published in national international journals He has successfully uh, guided 10 MPhil and 24 PhD scholars. Presently, two PhD scholars are working under his supervision. He has evaluated more than 50 PhD theses submitted to Indian and foreign universities. Uh, he has delivered uh, and sponsored 32 invited uh, keynote addresses and 78 plenary talks at national and international conferences in Bangladesh, Britain, Canada, China, Dubai, Germany, India, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Nepal. Oman, Philippines, Sri Lanka, Taiwan, Thailand, and Turkey. In addition to it, he has contributed to several seminars and conferences as a panel discussant and panel discussion moderator. He was invited to deliver special talks and conduct workshops for students and teachers at university in Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Nepal, Singapore, Thailand, UK, and Vietnam. Professor Patil has uh, bagged thousands of. Uh, uh, thousands of awards under his bag he, he has received lifetime membership award from english scholars bu and borders esbb international group of scholars outstanding contribution award from rajasthan association for study in english udaipur india lifetime lifetime achievement award from north maharashtra university teachers association jalgaon maharashtra india emeritus professor of award from kanya mahavidyalaya jalandhar best education award from international institute of management and education new delhi maharashtra bhushan rajasthri chhatrapati sahu maharaj state level award for excellence in education from milinda uh, sasna singh maharaj india we are so much uh, delighted uh, and over when uh, to see professor patil with us i remember uh, a session that i attended in uh, 2072 at little anis uh, in nanta conference he was a uh, very marvelous uh, a uh, key speaker to listen up uh, he will be facilitating on aspects of spoken english today on the session number 1 in the fourth day of this international virtual conference organized by promise number 7 over to you professor patil thank you mayor thank you very much uh, my dear friend and uh, a very good morning to you friends in nepal a very good morning to you friends good morning today, sir uh, good morning to talk about the different aspects of spoken english as you know spoken english is a very important skill or speaking is a very important skill now i'd like to begin with the first things first what are the goals of teaching english in our countries in nepal and in india the goals of teaching english in our countries are different from the goals of teaching english in 
uh, Britain or America or Australia or New Zealand, for instance. Now, since I've been teaching English to rural students and abroad, I have prioritized my goals like this. My first important objective, as far as the teaching of English is concerned, is to instill confidence in my learners. Because many of my learners are first generation learners. Many of them come from villages and little towns. So they, to begin with, they are nervous. They are shy and they're victims of inhibitions. So my first responsibility as the teacher of English is to help them overcome their diffidence, their nervousness, their inhibitions. So I would like to, first of all, instill confidence in my learners as far as spoken English is concerned. My second objective is to enable my learners to be fluent in the use of English, in the uh, use of written English as well as spoken English. So I have set for myself three important goals as far as the teaching of English in our countries is concerned. Number one, I want my learners to be confident. Number two, I want them to be fluent. And number three, I want them to use English appropriately. And finally, I want them to use English accurately. So there are four uh, important goals or three important goals of teaching English in India or in Nepal. We want to instill confidence in our learners. We want them to use English fluently. We want them to use English appropriately. And finally, we want, to, we want them to use English accurately or correctly. These are our goals. Uh, now, please remember, I'm talking about these goals in the context of the teaching of different aspects of spoken English, right? Now, when we talk about aspects of spoken English, we need to consider certain things. For example, we need to take into account the intelligibility aspect of English. Now, when I say intelligibility, I mean local intelligibility, national intelligibility, and international intelligibility. As you know, the new varieties of English are deviant in terms of grammar, in terms of use of vocabulary, in terms of uh, pronunciation, and so on and so forth. So one uh, frequent complaint that we hear about the users of English in the so-called non-native uh, countries is that their English is not intelligible. Now, as long as I'm in Maharashtra, my Marathi English works. But the moment I cross the borders of Maharashtra and enter another state of the country, or the moment I leave the borders of India and go to another country, to Britain, to Australia, to New Zealand, for instance, uh, I face certain problems or I may face certain problems. So before we start talking about aspects of spoken English, we need to uh, keep in mind certain things. Number one, we need to keep in mind the four important goals of teaching English in our countries. And the four important goals of teaching English in our countries are enabling our learners to be confident, enabling them to use English fluently, enabling them to use English appropriately and enabling them to use English accurately or correctly. That's number one. Number two, we need to bear in mind the concept, the notion of intelligibility, because intelligibility is a very important aspect of spoken English. Now, when I say this, I don't want to advocate the use of British English or American English or Australian English and so on and so forth. Now, you can see now that my English is neither British nor American nor Australian. My English is very much Indian variety of English. But uh, I can say it with uh, humility that uh, my English is perfectly intelligible to Nepalese friends, to British friends, to American friends, and they don't have to ask me to repeat what I have said time and again. So intelligibility is the second aspect that we need to keep in, keep in mind when we talk about uh, aspects of spoken English. Then, uh, before we actually start talking about the important aspects of spoken English, we need also to uh, say a few things about difference between spoken English and written English. It's a matter of common sense that the two varieties of English, spoken variety of English and written variety of English are not identical, they're different. They're different in terms of grammar, in terms of use of words, in terms of uh, so many other factors. For instance, 
the the words that we use when we speak english are simpler are easier than the words that we use when we write in english secondly the grammar of written english is rather more complex and the grammar of spoken english is not that complex it's it has to be it has got to be simple so the vocabulary of spoken english is easier the grammar of spoken english is simpler and when we speak in english or in any language for that matter in nepalese or in hindi or marathi we use hesitation markers we don't use them deliberately they 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 just happen we use hesitation markers we use uh, fillers and we use monitoring features and so on and so forth so we need to keep in mind certain things before we start talking actually about the important aspects or significant aspects of spoken english and as i said number one we need to keep in mind the important goals of teaching english enabling our learners to use english confidently fluently appropriately and accurately we also need to remember the factor of intelligibility that we need to be intelligible not only to our countrymen and countrywomen but also to uh, our friends in the other non native countries and our friends in the so called native countries we need to be intelligible to all of them and thirdly uh, our aim is not to uh, be able to use the exact uh, british or american or australian or canadian variety of english but our own variety of english but we need to take care we need to see to it that our our english our variety of english our native variety of english our own native variety of english is intelligible to everybody around us and then we also need to as i said some time ago we need to you know, bear in mind the differences between spoken variety and written variety now let me start uh, talking about the important aspects of spoken english and i'll take them one by one and i'll try to illustrate all these aspects uh, with examples the first thing is pronunciation so when we talk about spoken english or speaking we of course need to talk about pronunciation if we want to be good speakers and good communicators in english we need to master the pronunciation of english for example many speakers around us say opportunity they don't say opportunity many of them say for example um you know, familiar they don't say familiar right so pronunciation is a very important aspect for example many of our friends say epitome instead of saying epitome right they say extempore instead of saying extempore so pronunciation is a very, very important aspect wherever i go and talk about aspects of spoken english i uh, try to cite as many humorous examples as possible now i'm very fond of these examples because these these examples uh, are my first hand experiences because i taught english in vietnam and i taught english in japan and i've uh, delivered lectures in so many other countries so i've collected a uh, collected lots of data and i i use that those data to uh, yeah, illustrate my main ideas my points and also to teach english effectively and efficiently in different classes in india and abroad so pronunciation we need to master the pronunciation of english if we really want to become good speakers of english now uh, i briefly spoke about mispronunciation that certain words are usually mispronounced by the so called non native speakers of english nepalese speakers of english or indian speakers of english and so on and so forth so we need to be careful uh, and what is important is intelligibility right uh, the british speak british speakers say for example they try to insert uh, the r sound between two words like idea and is because the is the word is begins with the vowel sound british speakers try to insert a, a r sound there my idea my idea is now this is not important secondly it's not important for us to to aspirate certain sounds we don't have to say cat we don't have to say put we can just say cat and put so aspiration is not a very significant aspect of spoken english it doesn't bring about a change in the meaning of the words so we don't have to be so careful about aspiration we don't have to run after it or master it 
But when it comes to unintelligibility, when it comes to misunderstanding, uh, then we need to be careful and we need to pronounce those words properly. Now, I keep telling my students, if you really want to master the pronunciation of this language or any language for that matter, then you can identify certain patterns of pronunciation and you can practice one pattern each week. For example, uh, there is a pattern called osophy or ology, psychology, philosophy, choreography, and so on and so forth. So what the students and what the teachers can also do is to select or to choose a topic, choose a pattern and practice it, rehearse it, uh, you know, week after week. So there are about, let's say, uh, how many weeks are there in a, in a, in a year? About, about 50. There are about 50 weeks in a year. Now you can subtract, let's say 10 weeks because you have to entertain guests. You have to go on a tour and you have to, you are not, sometimes you're not feeling well. So you're left 40 weeks in a weeks a year. So you can practice at least 40 patterns of pronunciation over a year. And by the end of the year, you can notice, you can realize that your accent, your pronunciation is very, very good. Right. So patterns are very important. The first important significant aspect, the first important or significant or vital aspect of spoken English is pronunciation. We need to master it in order to be intelligible. Secondly, words have, I believe that words have their own personalities. I have a personality, you have a personality over there. Each one of you sitting in that particular hall in Nepal has a personality and our personalities have different aspects or facets to it. Right? Physical personality, spiritual personality, psychological or mental personality, intellectual personality, and so on and so forth. In the same way, by the same token, each word has a personality. And there are different facets to this verbal or vocabulary or lexical personality. Phonic aspect is there. So we need to be careful when we pronounce words. You know, we need to pronounce them properly, accurately, and also appropriately, because appropriateness is very important. Let's cite an example. You know, I, some time ago I spoke about uh, developing confidence and enabling our learners to speak English fluently, appropriately, and accurately. In my opinion, accuracy, of course, is important, but what is more important than accuracy is appropriateness. Sometimes uh, we, we connive at or we ignore pronunciation mistakes and grammatical mistakes committed or made by our learners or our colleagues and friends and neighbors and visitors. But we, we are very serious about the tone of their spoken English or the tone of their written English. I personally would prefer that spoken English which has a few mistakes of pronunciation and collocation and grammar and so on and so forth but which has a very polite and courteous tone. So tone is very important. So a word has a phonic personality. A word also has a graphic personality. So when we write a word, we spell it accurately. Like for example, mnemonic. How do we spell the word mnemonic? Mnemonic device. The word, the, the first sound of the, in the word is n, but the first letter is m, mnemonic. So we need to spell words properly. Incidentally, uh, there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between letters and sounds in English. I don't know about other languages, but as far as English is concerned, you know and I know that there is no one-to-one -one correspondence or relationship between, word, between letters of the English alphabet and sounds of the English language. By the way, many people say uh, there are 26 alphabets in English. Now, let me tell you that there is only one alphabet and the alphabet comprises 26 letters. It consists of 26 letters. So there are 26 letters, but there is just one single alphabet. Now, let me go back to the uh, correspondence between letters and sounds. Here is an example. The fat father narrated the tale of the fallen angel. 
Now let's look at the use of the first letter of the English alphabet in this utterance. And the first letter of the English alphabet is the letter A. The fact in this word, the same letter, the letter A is pronounced as A. I'm talking about correspondence between letters on the one hand and sounds on the, <coughs> excuse me, on the other. So in fact, A is pronounced as A. In father, the same letter is pronounced as or articulated as A. Narrated in the word narrate, the same letter is used twice, N-A, double R-A, T-E-D. So A appears twice. In the first case, it is A. In the second case, it is A. So A in fat, A in father, A in no, A in rated, the tail, again A, of the fallen fallen the same letter is pronounced as o so this simple example this uh, concocted or made up example you know shows to us or tells us that the relationship between letters in english and sounds of english or letters of english and sounds of english is not one to one sometimes one letter is used for several sounds and sometimes several letters are used for one sound so we need to keep this uh, this graphic phonic uh, correspondence in mind before we or when we talk about uh, words and their personalities. A word also has, as I said, a word has a graphic word has a phonic personality, the sound, the pronunciation. A word has a graphic personality, the spelling of the word, and the word also has a grammatical personal aspect to it, aspect to its personality. For example, uh, the word p r e s e n t is present. It is pronounced as present when it is used as a noun or as, a, as an adjective. And the same spelling, the same word, the same graphic form of the word is pronounced as present when it's used as a verb. So uh, it's not just a matter of pronunciation, different pronunciations of the word present or present, P-R-E-S-E-N-T, but also a matter of uh, grammatical aspect of the personality of the word P-R-E-S-A-N-T. Then a word also has a contextual personality. A single word can have 10 different meanings in 10 different contexts. We embed a word in this context and we have, a, we have this meaning. We embed the same word in that context and we have that meaning. So there is a phonic aspect, there is a graphic aspect, there is a grammatical aspect, there is a contextual aspect and there is a semantic aspect. A word has a meaning and usually, you know, we know that a language doesn't exist in a dictionary. A language doesn't live in a grammar book. A language lives and exists in contexts in the society out there. So, but a dictionary gives us meanings, basically meanings. Sometimes a dictionary may give us or can give us um, different contextual meanings, but that's very rare. Usually a dictionary is a list of uh, semantic aspects, semantic aspects of per the personalities of words. Then we also have a pragmatic aspect to the personality of a particular word that, you know, sometimes the word is positive, but the meaning is negative and vice versa. So when we talk about aspects of spoken English, we need to remember pronunciation and how to master it. And we need to remember the different aspects of the personality of the words, like phony, graphic, grammatical, contextual, semantic, and pragmatic, and so on and so forth. Stress is also very significant. There are three types of stress, actually, I want to talk about. One, word stress. A word may consist of one syllable or more than one syllable. For example, in the word, uh, in the word, word, W O R D, there is just one syllable. And the center of this syllable is the vowel sound uh, uh, word. The nucleus of the syllable is in this in this particular vowel sound. But this word, word, has only one syllable. I'm not saying it is not stressed. It is stressed. I mean each syllable is stressed. 
we can't say unstressed. People say this syllable is stressed, but that syllable is unstressed. It's not unstressed. Certain syllables are stressed uh, more strongly than other syllables, but all syllables are stressed, more or less stressed. So word stress is important. Like for example, photograph, P-H-O-T-O-G-R-A-P-H, photograph. In the word photograph, the first part of the word that is pho, the word has three parts, three syllables, syllables, photograph. In this case, the stress falls on the first syllable, photograph. When we change this word, when we add an e, add er to this word, the word uh, accent or stress moves from the first syllable to the second syllable, photographer, photograph, photographer. And in the case of the word photographical, the stress falls on the third syllable. So photograph, photographer and photographical. This is what I mean when I say uh, we need to remember that there is word stress, something called word stress. Now there are a few words, about 50 to 60 words in English, not many, there are just about 50 or 60 words in English, uh, which carry grammatical stress. And I give you one example in a different context. And that example is P-R-E-S-E-N-T. When it's used as a noun or adjective, it is pronounced as present, present. And the accent, the stress falls on the first syllable, not on the second syllable. But when the same word is used as a verb, the accent of the stress falls on the second syllable, present. Right, like this, there are many, there are a few words like object, object. Subject, subject, convict, convict, produce, produce, and so on. I can go on and give you a long list of words, but you can find out all these words from a dictionary, for instance, or a book on phonetics and phonology. So there is something called word stress. There is something called grammatical stress. And there is something called sentence stress. Now, I'll give you, let me give you a few examples. Suppose you say, uh, Mr. Patil, you had a session this morning, but you didn't appear. And then I can say, but I was there. Suppose you say you were not there on the screen. Mr. Patil, you were not there on the screen. And because I want to uh, contradict what you have said, I will say, I'll em emphasize the word was. And I say, but I was there in usual context was is not pronounced as was it is pronounced as was i was there and we'll talk about we forms very shortly in a different context but in the broad context of spoken english of course so there is something called word stress and something called grammatical stress and something called sentence stress let me give you another example of sentence stress let's say i have a sentence or utterance like this kiran broke this window in the evening yesterday. Now I can convey five, six different uh, shades of meaning, not completely different meanings, but shades of meaning, uh, you know, using different uh, locations of stress in this particular sentence or utterance. Say, suppose I want to emphasize, I want to draw attention to the breaker of the window. They say, Kiran broke this window in the evening yesterday. So the focus is on the breaker, right? And then I can move the stress from the first word to the second one. Kiran broke this window in the evening yesterday. Right? Kiran broke this window in the evening yesterday, not Zedan Patil. Kiran broke this window in the evening yesterday. He didn't paint it, he broke it. Kiran broke this window in the evening yesterday. So I'm not talking about that window or that window, I'm talking about this particular window. So I highlight the word this window. And suppose I want to suggest that he didn't break a door or a tool or a, a stool or a teapot or something like that. Then I say, Kiran broke this window in the evening yesterday, not a door. And suppose I want to focus my attention, your attention, the listener's attention uh, to the time of the breaking of the window. Then I say, Kiran broke this window in the evening yesterday. And Suppose I say, Kiran broke this window in the evening yesterday, not today. This is what I mean by, uh, by sentence stress. 
word stress is not mobile. You can't move. We can't move word stress from one part to the other part. For example, uh, I can't just, uh, suppose I say photograph, right? Or I say uh, photograph and Motikala just says photograph. I mean, we don't have freedom to pronounce or to accentuate or to stress words differently. What is photograph for me is photograph for everyone coming from all parts of the world. What is photographer for me is photographer for everyone coming from any part of the globe. So word stress is fixed. It cannot be moved from one part to another, except in the case of those words like present and present and produce and produce and convict and convict. Only those handful of words uh, can be manipulated like that with a purpose. So we've said a few things about enunciation, about different aspects to the personality of the words and about uh, word stress, sentence stress and grammatical stress. How about rhythm? Do you think rhythm is important? Yes, of course it is important. And uh, one complaint about Asian, spe Asian speakers of English is that their English is, or our English is, sing song English, that we don't use proper rhythm. Once uh, I was observing an English lesson in a school, I was invited as a subject expert and the district education officer was with me. We were sitting at the back of the class and the teacher was reciting the nursery rhyme, actually reading from the printed book, the nursery rhyme, Jack and Jill. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling after. This is the way he read the nursery rhyme from the book. After the class, I called him in camera in private. I didn't want to give my advice or my suggestion to him in the presence of other people. So I called him in camera in private. And I said, uh, are you a socialist? He didn't understand the intent of my question. But then he said, why do you want to know whether I'm a socialist or a communist or a Democrat or whatever? I said, why did you emphasize each and every word of the nursery rhyme? There are certain words which are functional words or structure words, and there are certain words which are content words, information carrying words. It's like a train. A train consists of uh, different coaches, many the, several, several coaches or compartments. And the compartments are joined with the help of buffers. So the compartment is like a noun, a verb, an adjective, an adverb, information carrying word. And the, the buffer is like article, preposition, conjunction, and so on. So I said, if I were in your place, and if I were to recite this nursery rhyme, I would do it like this. Jack and Jill. So I would not have said, and I would have said, and Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. A pail of, not a pail of. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling after. This is what is meant this is what I mean when I say we need to be careful as far as the rhythm of the language is concerned. Now, rhythm is everywhere. When you go to a beach, we look at the uh, waves on the shore and you see ripples coming one after the other. When we listen to the clock on the wall, we hear tick tock, tick tock. When we place a stethoscope on the chest, on our chest or on somebody else's chest, and listen to the uh, working of the functioning of the heart, we say drum, 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 drum. So there is something called light and something called heavy, something called weak and something called strong, right? So there is a rhythm, there is a pattern of strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak syllables in English. So it, it, has, uh, it has its own rhythm. Now in this context, we need to talk about weak forms. Now, when we talk about weak forms, we, of course, talk about prepositions like, uh, uh, let's say, OF, of, right? It is not OFF. In connected speech, we don't say OFF, we say OF, right? Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water, of water, so it becomes OF, not OFF. So prepositions are weakened, articles, like we don't say AND, usually. 
<laughs> when there is a special purpose, we we do see use the strong form. For example, when we are teaching grammar, when we are teaching articles, we say a is an indefinite article. An is used before words which begin with vowel sounds. So in these cases, we can say a and an. But when we use a and an in connected speech, we don't say them as a and an. We say them as a. I want an umbrella. We don't say I want an umbrella. I want an umbrella. I want an apple. Right? I saw a man. I saw a snake. A snake. A man. An umbrella. Right? So uh, these are weak forms. Please remember uh, that there is one more class. I spoke. I mentioned prepositions. I mentioned articles. Uh, I must mention auxiliary verbs, like or helping verbs, which include modals, modals like can, must, shall, and so on and so forth. So can becomes can, shall becomes shall, must becomes must. Similarly, have and has become have and has, uh, have and has, or have and has. Right? There are many variations within the context. So, uh, prepositions, articles, helping verbs are usually weakened in connected speech, and that is what uh, that is one of the factors that adds to the rhythm of this beautiful language. A spoken variety of English is characterized by certain other features, a few more features, and one of those features is question tags. Right? Isn't it? So, when we use a question tag, uh, our, our spoken English becomes living English. If we don't, if, if you, for example, if we converse for one hour, if two people converse for one hour or two hours, and none of them, neither of them uses a question tag, then that conversation is rather monotonous, you know. So question tags are very important. They are an important feature, vital feature of spoken variety of English. And I don't have to delve deep into the grammar of question tags. You know that usually when the sentence is positive, the tag is negative and vice versa. Mohan has done the homework, hasn't he? Mohan has done the homework, hasn't he? Right? Uh, she hasn't left, has she? So positive sentence followed by negative tag, negative sentence followed by positive tag. But tags are very important. They are very important. They are a very important feature of spoken English. And we need to use question tags time and again. Contracted forms is another feature of spoken variety of English. When we write, usually when we write a formal document, I'm not talking about informal letters. In informal letters, for example, you can use short, you know, short forms or contracted forms like uh, hasn't, isn't, wasn't, weren't, shan't, won't, right? And uh, uh, he's, that is he is, right? Or he has. He's can be, he uh, can be a contracted form of he has or he is. He's left, right? Uh, he's done. Or oh, he's there. In the sentence, he's there. The stands for is, and he's left in the sentence. Uh, the stands for has. So contracted forms of auxiliary verbs and con contracted forms of pronouns followed by verbs are an important feature of uh, spoken English. When we uh, discuss different aspects of spoken English, we need to also consider given information and new information. Because sometimes I come across people, students, as well as teachers, who use, who all the time use full sentences. For example, where do you come from? If this is my, the new information, the rest of it is given information. Chandra Bahadur uh, is the new information and the rest of the sentence is, the unspoken sentence is given information. So given information is not repeated. Only the new information is offered or given. Focus is an important aspect of uh, spoken English. 
like for example uh, let me go back to the catch another sentence for example uh, okay let me give let me uh, cite the same example and then go to the other example which window did kiran break in the evening yesterday this one so the the answerer will give me only the new information right so given information and new information uh these are two different aspects of spoken english or english for that matter but yeah, we are talking about spoken english presently focus is also very important let's look at this utterance which consists of three words i should go i can focus my attention and i can draw your attention to either i or should or go and i can convey different meanings or even four meanings or more than that so i say i should go that means not you i should go that means you can't stop me and i should go that i'm seeking your advice what's your opinion do you think i should go so i should go not you i should go you can't stop me i should go i'm seeking your advice and the fourth one can be i should go that means i'm supposed to go but i'm not sure whether i'll be able to go or not this is called focus and uh, we can use intonation for this particular purpose and we're going to talk about intonation shortly so the distinction between formal and informal variety of english is applicable to this uh, uh, sub this topic aspects of spoken english now spoken english is usually usually not all the time not always spoken english is usually informal and written english is usually formal now let me cite an example uh when a father died when her father died radha had to see radha had to find another job when her father died radha had to get another job one after her father's death radha had to look for another job and number 3 on the demise on the decease of a father radha had to seek alternative employment now i'm sure you have understood the point that the third sentence on the demise on the decease of a father radha had to seek alternative employment is very formal it's a fro is a frozen kind of sentence all right it's a very frozen sentence it's a very formal sentence we usually don't use uh, sentences unless we are quiet to uh, for the purpose of uh, creating humor or something like that so the first two are relatively comparatively uh, less formal or relatively comparatively informal and the two sentences are when her father died radha had to get another job is informal or oh, semi informal semi formal after her father's death radha had to find another job this is also not formal but the third one is very formal so when we speak we need to keep this distinction in mind otherwise people will laugh at us many of our friends in nepal and in india and other countries speak uh, as if they were books and the reason is that you were taught through shakespeare and dryden and pope and uh, chaucer and so on and so forth and we try to speak as if we were uh, walking talking books and our english becomes very formal and that's why uh, sometimes people giggle giggle they they laugh at us or they laugh at our english so we need to keep this uh, distinction in mind contrast we can suggest a contrast through our uh through our tone for that for that matter for example example uh let me go back to the same example uh, because you remember that example for a variety of purposes kiran broke this window in the evening yesterday right when i say kiran broke this window in the evening yesterday i'm contrasting the act of breaking the window with the act of making the window and so on and so forth so this is what i mean by uh, contrast suppose somebody says somebody who is not very familiar with politics 
in India and who doesn't read newspapers or whatever. And he says, or she says, <clears throat> Nirav Modi is the Prime Minister of India, isn't he? Nirav Modi is the Prime Minister of India, isn't he? And I know that it's not Nirav Modi. Nirav Modi is uh, in London seeking refuge there. He is not the Prime Minister. So I say, no, 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 Narendra Modi is the Prime Minister of India. So I'm contrasting Nirav with Narendra. So for that purpose, I use emphasis or focus. So contrast is an important function of tone of voice. Focus is another, as I explained some time ago. There is something called common core English, common core variety of English. Let me give you an example. Feeling tired, Ashok went to bed early. Feeling tired, Ashok went to bed early. The second sentence is, Ashok went to bed early because he felt tired. And the third one is, he felt tired and so Ashok went to bed early. Now, the common core is, uh, common care core consists of those two sentences. The first one is rather formal. It appears in written discourse, like feeling tired, Ashok went to bed a little early, right? Now, tone group is also very important. For example, uh, if it rains, the match will be canceled. The, sent the utterance consists of two tone groups or sense groups, meaning groups. And the comma is an indication of the end of the, uh, end of the first tone group or sense group or meaning group and beginning of the second tone or uh, meaning group. So, for example, if it rains is the first tone group, the match will be canceled is the second tone group, right? So we need to observe tone group uh, breakups when we talk, otherwise our English becomes uh, unintelligible, sometimes incomprehensible. There is a difference between un unintelligibility and incomprehensibility, but I don't, I don't want to go into those details right now because that's not our focus. So, Tone groups are very important. Pauses are important. We are not robots. So we naturally require, you know, to take uh, breath. We need to inhale and exhale. And for that particular purpose, at least, we need to take pauses. Pauses can bring about a change in the meaning of uh, the utterances. For example, I say, uh, he failed in English, history, mathematics and geography. He failed in English, history, mathematics and geography. So I have taken a pause with English and history, history and mathematics. And of course the last pair is gonna, you know, join with the help of the connector or conjunction, conjunction uh, conjuncting words, connecting word and. So he failed in English, pause, history, pause, mathematics and geography. Suppose I remove the pause between English and history. In the first case, there are four subjects. If I remove the pause between the first, uh, between English and history, there will be only three pauses. He failed in English history, mathematics and geography. So in the first instance, when there is a pause between English and history, there are four subjects, right? And he failed in all the four. In the second instance, when there is no pause between English and history, there are only three subjects and he failed in three subjects. What's the meaning of English, um, what's the meaning of English history? History of England. He failed in history, he failed in English, pause, history, pause, mathematics and geography. He failed in English history, no pause between English and history, but pause after history. He failed in English history, mathematics, and geography. So in the first case, English and history were two different subjects. In the second case, English history is one single subject, history of England. So pauses can change the meaning of utterances. They're very important and we need to master pauses as well. Intonation is important. Now, I will not talk about all different types of intonation or patterns, all different patterns of intonation, but I'll focus only on the two frequently used patterns and the, these two patterns are falling pattern and rising pattern. 
Now, when do we use the following pattern? In which cases do we use the following pattern? We use the following pattern in the case of a statement, in the case of an order or command, and in the case of a WH question. Where were you yesterday? Where were you yesterday? My voice falls. My voice falls. Where were you yesterday? All right? Have I used a rising tone? No, I haven't. I have used a falling tone. Where were you yesterday? This is the WH question and that's why my voice came down, fell down or fell. Do this for me. This is a command, this is an order. And therefore, uh, there is a fall, I've used a falling tone. So WH questions take falling tone, usually, not all the time. There are a few exceptions here and there. WH questions take falling tone. Orders, commands take falling tone. And statements also take falling tones, right? At the moment, I'm talking about aspects of spoken English, right? Or we're talking about aspects of spoken English. So falling tone is used for statements, WH questions and commands. Rising tone is used for no questions, requests, and uh, uh, when there is a list of things, like for example, let me give you an example. Examples, uh, uh, I said that a, falling, a rising tone is used for yes, no questions and requests and a uh, uh, list of things. For example, have you done the homework? Have you done the homework? Rising tone, right? It's a yes, no question. You can say yes, I have. No, I haven't. Sorry, I haven't. So have you done the homework, rising tone, for a yes-no question? Can you, can you cook for me, please? Can you cook for me, please? This is a request, and therefore I've used rising tone. And suppose I go shopping and I, uh, I have a list of things, uh, and I bought a few things, and I say, I went to a supermarket and bought some sugar, milk, tea powder, and butter. So on the first three items, my voice goes up and on the last item, my voice falls or comes down, right? So intonation is very important. There are two important functions of intonation and these two important functions of intonation are one, expression of attitude. Two, change in the grammar of the sentence or utterance. Now, let me give you an example of the second one that uh, uh, there is a grammatical function of intonation patterns. Let's say, I'm flying to Mumbai tomorrow. What kind of sentence is it? It's a statement, isn't it? Yes, it is a statement. I'm flying to Mumbai tomorrow. And it's a falling tone because it's a statement. So you, when you hear my sentence, I'm flying to Mumbai tomorrow morning, you automatically, instantly, instantaneously, immediately, realize that I have made a statement. I haven't asked a question. But suppose I say, uh, suppose I say, I don't know that my boss wants me to go to Mumbai, right? I don't know. I go to his office and I say, uh, I'm going to Mumbai tomorrow. I want to seek information from the boss because he has decided to send me to Mumbai and I'm not in the awareness, in the, in the know of things. I'm not aware of it. So I'm, I'm flying to Mumbai tomorrow is a statement. The words are the same. The, the word orders are the same. I am flying to Mumbai tomorrow. Six words, same words in the same order in both the cases. In the first case, it's, an, it's a statement. In the second case, I'm going to Mumbai tomorrow, which is a yes, no question. And the boss will say yes. I've decided to send you to Mumbai tomorrow. Oh, or no, you're not going to Mumbai. I haven't decided to send you to Mumbai. So the words are the same and they occur, they appear in the same sequence in both the sentences or utterances. But in the first instance, it's a statement because the tone is falling. And in the second instance, 
it's a yes no question because the tone is rising so this is called uh, these are called or these are examples of grammatical function of intonation i also said that intonation expresses or indicates or suggests the tone of the speaker positive tone negative tone a uh, friendly tone unfriendly tone or uh, you know intimate tone formal tone and so on and so forth suppose uh i go to i i go to kathmandu next week right and i go to motugala ji she invites me to a house and she wants to introduce me to a family yeah, she is a very kind person so i go to her it's my first visit to her place it's my first day in kathmandu and i say to her motikala ji i'd like to have a cold drink i'd like to have a cold drink the tone is now i'd like to have a cold drink is a falling tone because i'm making a sort of uh statement but if i say it with a rising tone it will become a request right as i already uh, said to you so i'd like to have a cold drink and she will say because she is a very polite person she will say you would you would now when you listen to this these two sentences you would you realize that the tone is rising and rising tone is usually very polite very friendly very hospitable welcoming tone so motikala ji i'd like to have a cold drink and she will say you would she is a very hospitable person very friendly person she wants to offer uh, eatables and drinks to me and i keep going to her house every day for a month and it's 31st 31st of the month the last day of the month and i uh, say to her motikala ji i'd like to have a cold drink she may not say what i'm going to say but uh, in you in, uh, usually uh, the host will say something like that using that particular tone motikala ji i'd like to have a cold drink and she may say you would i know you've been to my place uh, every day you come to me every day and you have, every day you ask for cold drink and i have exhausted all my salary monthly salary on your cold drinks on your hospitality she wants to say so many things but she doesn't say all these things because she is a very polite person but she expresses her attitude to me as a guest through her falling tone the rising tone is hospitable on the first day her tone was very uh, very friendly hospitable welcoming offering tone maybe for the first week she was like that but gradually the second week third week and last week of the month her tone changed from rising to falling and i understood that she was sick of my visits and or i understand that she is sick of my visits and i stop going to her right so tone is also expressed can also be expressed through intonation right so we need to pay attention to intonation patterns as well now one or two last points actually the last point there are so many other things that i'd like to talk about today but since our time is limited and since we need to keep some time reserve some time for questions and answers i'd like to uh, say a few things about or just one or two points now do you think polite expressions are an important aspect or important part of uh, spoken english i think so your spoken english cannot be uh, cannot be uh, acceptable cannot become acceptable and appropriate unless you use certain polite and polite expressions and these polite expressions are very important like for example when we play uh, when we take part in formula 1 race or when we play cricket or when we play even soccer or so many other sports we use certain pads why do we use certain pads we use certain pads uh, because we want to protect our knees our uh, our elbows our heads and so on and so forth our abdomens uh and so on and so forth from the fast ball or pace bowling or whatever right so we use pads protective measures to protect ourselves physically from so many things similarly we need to use pads to protect our relationships 
our relationships with our neighbors, our family members, our colleagues, our uh, employers, our friends, and so on and so forth. All these relationships are very important. It takes us, it takes us years and years to establish and to strengthen relationships and ties, but it takes only a few minutes to break these lovely relationships. And therefore, it's very important for all of us to use polite expressions like, thank you so much, Motikalaji. I'm so grateful to you, Motikalaji. Uh, I can't thank you enough, Motikalaji. Right? Uh, if I have done something wrong, I say, I, I promise, Motikalaji, I won't do it again. I promise that it won't happen again. I apologize. I regret for this particular kind of behavior, so on and so forth. Now, one day, since I come from a farming family, uh, one day I was sitting under a banana tree and suddenly the banana flower that was hanging from the tree, banana tree, caught my attention, drew my attention. And I began to ponder, began to think about the banana flower. I opened one layer of banana leaves, uh, I mean, uh, one layer of leaves from the flower, the conical flower, and what I found was tiny bananas, baby bananas, very fragile, very cute, easily breakable baby bananas. And then I said to myself, isn't mother nature so creative? Isn't mother nature very caring? Why is it that she has couched or placed these baby bananas between two layers of leaves in the banana flower? Why is it so? And then I myself found the answer and I said, because you know, because Mother Nature wants to protect her babies, these baby bananas, from heat and dust and rain and storm and cattle, maybe. She has placed these baby bananas between two layers or covers of leaves. And then I said, aren't our relationships with other people similar to these baby bananas? Shouldn't we be protecting these? Shouldn't we be using uh, covers? which exist in the form of expressions like, thank you, sorry, I apologize. You are such a wonderful person, you are such a beautiful person, and so on and so forth. Now, complimenting people on their achievements, on their appearances, on their successes, and so on and so forth, is an important strategy. And we can use uh, complimenting to establish relationships, to strengthen them, to consolidate them, and to preserve them, safeguard them, continue them. Now, when we teach English in our classes, what we do is we, we uh, summarize the story or summarize the central idea of the form, but, but we neglect, we neglect very many significant, vital, important aspects of the language that we are teaching, all right? We dictate notes on summaries, on uh, paraphrases and so on and so forth. But we don't draw or we fail to draw the attention of the learner as to such aspects of pauses. For example, when we teach plays, any play for that matter, Shakespearean play or Johnsonian play or uh, Osbornean play, John Osborne play, any play for that matter, all these features of spoken English or spoken variety, spoken language are available. We need to tap them, we need to exploit them, we need to draw the attention of the learners to these resources which are already available in the form of conversations that take place in that particular play on those plays. But that's not done. That's, I mean, hardly is it done. We don't do it. And we waste many beautiful opportunities of teaching language and developing their spoken English, developing their spoken communication skills and so on and so forth. Thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Motikalaji and Joshiji. This is a wonderful opportunity. I'm happy to do something for my colleagues in Nepal. And Nepal is like my second home, uh, homeland. And I've said it time and again, right? Uh, I've received love and affection and hospitality, plenty of these things from my Nepali friends. And I would love to go back to Nepal again and again. Right? 
So I look forward to meeting you again. Uh, I, I think we have met again. We have met. We already met a couple of times. I've been uh, I've been to Nepal five times, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not wrong. And I'd like to visit Nepal again and again and again. And I'm sure he will say the doors are open, Mr. Patil. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Professor Patil, for your <laughs> penetrating presentation here, the sharing. We, we know that uh, uh, it has it has the comments we have been just seeing here in chat box uh, depicts what sort of presentation they got today from you. Thank you so, Thank much. You so much. On behalf of yep. Nelta, Nelta Center, whole Nelta family of Nepal. So uh, I'm like a life member, by the way. You know that I'm a life member. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, sir. I know. So I uh, you know we do not have word to express that. How? Uh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, but because of uh, uh, time limitation, we are unable to go for interaction right now, sir. I apologize for it. Uh, no problem. But if they have a quick question, maybe one or two questions they can ask. Yes, please. So, dear friends, if you have any question, if quick question, because quick question. it will not be in two minutes, three minutes, yes. five second question, please. Anyone? And I heard some people talking when I was talking here. Maybe their, their mobiles were not uh, muted. So they can ask questions now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, friends. Anyone has any query? Please raise your hand. I could just unmute you. It seems that no okay. one has a question. Damodar Giri, sir. Damodar Giri, sir, are you there? Yes, sir. Your question, yes. please. Hello. Okay. That are you wonder? Yes. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, 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 I can hear you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Patil, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, thank you, my uh, pleasure. And, uh, most of the time, we we try to be like a uh, native live speaker. And uh -huh. actually, what makes what uh, makes uh, different or obstacles us to be like native speaker? Okay, thank you for this question. It's a very important question, very good question, very probing question. And it's a very frequently asked question. Now, as I said at the right, right at the outset, my objective, your objective, our objective is not to emulate, blindly imitate the so-called native speakers. Because even within Britain, for instance, there are so many varieties. If you go, when you go to Yorkshire, you are face to face with one variety of English. When you go to Glasgow, you are face to face with another variety of English. So even within a small country like Britain, there are so many different and deviant varieties of English. Sometimes these uh, national varieties of English within Britain uh, tend to be unintelligible to themselves, right? Like somebody from Glasgow may not be un easily understood by somebody who is a resident of London, for instance, and vice versa. So uh, I don't think we aim at that particular kind of blind imitation or blind emulation a blind copy of the so-called native speaker. What I said is we want to attain comfortable intelligibility, not absolute intelligibility. Like whenever I, wherever I go, whether I go to Britain or America or Australia or New Zealand or Philippines or Vietnam or Japan, nobody should say, uh, Mr. Patil, I'm sorry, I didn't get you. Mr. Patil, could you please repeat yourself? I'm sorry, I didn't get you. I didn't catch you. I don't want people to say that. So my aim is not to speak, not to use British, Australian, American, Canadian variety of English. My aim is to use Indian variety or Asian variety of English, which is internationally understandable, internationally intelligible. So let's not imitate those so-called native speakers blindly. I hope I've answered my question. Your question? Yeah, yeah. Of course, sir. Yeah, of thank course. You. 